empowerment at the heart of project leadership. In this webinar, Suzanne will discuss the importance of emotional intelligence to project leadership and how it can help you create a fully empowered and high performing team. No matter your level of experience, there are powerful lessons that we can all learn as part of our own professional development. The presentation will provide you with many insights and hopefully a few aha moments. And as you'll see there, topics covered, the difference between management and leadership, leadership styles, and the correlation between leadership and yin and yang. You'll also learn what emotional intelligence is and how you can build on it, how to build high performing teams and how to plan collaboratively. And I know that is truly collaboratively. Uh, the webinar is intended to be practical and interactive. And as I said before, you're encouraged to participate using menti.com with the code supplied 325361 and submit any questions as they occur to you and look for that Q&A session at the end. So, oh, rushed forward too much. There we go. Uh, so at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Suzanne, who will introduce herself. Uh, Suzanne, welcome. Thank you, Merv, and welcome to everybody listening. As you can hear, there is a lot we want to cover with you this morning or midday, as it were. I think it's appropriate that I share a little bit about my own passion for project leadership and leading teams. And I've been running projects for a long time. It says 20 years here. It's um, yeah, it is a long time. But I think the defining moment for me was some years back around 2008, because at that time I was in the middle of a huge implementation of a project uh, in, um, in, in the heart of London in finance. And I was so lucky I was invited to attend a leadership course. And as part of that leadership course, I was coached for the first time. And it gave me a few aha moments. And the first aha moment was, oh my God, I felt empowered. And it's one of these words that we can tend to overuse a little bit, but I truly felt that the, the whole world opened up for me and I, I thought, oh my God, there, there is something I can be doing differently here. And that was on the back of a one hour coaching session. And the other epiphany I had was that project managers need leadership. So that set me off on a completely new path. I began to study coaching. I began to write my first book, the project management coaching workbook. And from 2013 onwards, that's what I've really been doing full time. I've been coaching project managers full time. I've been running leadership courses full time in for project managers and I've been training in project management. So that's a little bit of background into my own shift, really. <clears throat> and as we said today, it's really focusing a little bit more in on how to empower people. But first, we want to make sure that you really get the hang of using Menti interactively. So we're going to uh, going to take you back to Merv, who will um, again in, uh, tell you a little bit more about how to use Menti and to answer the first question we have for you. OK, thanks very much, Suzanne. So uh, again, uh, if you can log in, if you haven't already done so, we've got a few different question types. So you'll you'll see that come up for you. This one is simply after a um, a one word answer. You've got, a, a, I think, a couple of opportunities. And what we want to know is which term best describes why you're attending this webinar and what you would like to learn. So um, we feel it's quite useful for you to think about that up front because clearly you can then assess whether or not um, that's been satisfied from the webinar. So, and I think you can see this, Suzanne. So um, you can see what people want to learn. So please, we have project leadership in the middle here. And learning about accountability. Not really sure how we're going to learn about spare time. Not really sure what that means. Hard is always good. Um, somebody is curious. That's also good to have an open mind. Project leadership again. And um, yeah, if we can have a few more people at their comments. I'm guessing as we go along, more people will log in, which is good. We've got um, 
so people know uh, they're not on their own. We've got uh, 35 people on the call, which is great. So, and the size of the lettering there gives you an indication of, uh, you know, the fact that more more people are, are providing that. So, uh, leadership seems to be right up there. But we can see a few other things coming in there, and uh, things like assurance and capability. So, um, I think it, to an extent, it's people warming up. Okay, what I'm going to do now, I think, is if I hand over to you, and there'll be more questions that we'll come back to, so uh, uh, keep that Mentimeter page open. So let's just switch to you, Suzanne. And there we go. I think you can display your screen now. Yeah. Wonderful. So we're going to start off looking at why we're really on this webinar. Why are we even talking about empowerment? Why are we even here to learn more about project management? And for me, one of the big reasons is that we are not where we want to be with project delivery. So we still have 40% of strategic initiatives failing. This is according to PMI. I have three statistics coming up. They're all from PMI's pulse reports. So the next one here. Oops, I have to go forward with the arrow. Okay, 50% of projects are delivered on time, or we could say only 52% of projects are delivered on time. And we have a third one, 69% meet their goals and business intent. So that's perhaps slightly better, but there is still a long way to go. And the last one here is from the UK, from the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. Less than half had a green or amber green status. I know that we can debate the statistics, they vary a little bit depending on the sector, depending on how we've measured them. But no matter what statistics we look at, we can certainly conclude that we are not where we want to be with projects. So there is still more for us to learn. And this, for me, begs the question, why do projects continue to fail? Because we have, after all, more and more people learning about project management, more and more people qualifying in the different methodologies. So why do we year after year see the same, relative same failure statistics? Sometimes they go up a bit and then we seem to take a step back. I don't, I don't pretend that I have all the answers, but I think one of the key answers is that there is growing complexity. So what does it mean? It means that technological change is unprecedented. We have more global competition, which is putting increasing pressures on our teams to deliver on time and cut back perhaps on any, any um, buffers that they have inside of their, of their um, plans as well. We have global interdependency. We have increasing number of stakeholders, which gives us something that we call socio-political complexity when more people are involved and we have more and more teams working remotely and from different time zones. So what's really interesting is that what we learn normally in project management is more about the tools and the techniques and the processes. And that may help us with let's say structural complexity when you have a product that's technically complex. But what we're seeing now is that we have more socio-political complexity. And we also have what we call emergent complexity, which is complexity that's related to changes. So we have a changing environment. For me, all of this points to the fact that pure project management is not enough. It is not enough that we are good at analyzing projects, planning projects, and using the methodologies, we need leaders who can deal with this new kind of complexity, who can collaborate and empower, and this is where this word comes in again, who can empower and gain in from all, gain buy-in from all, in par all, sorry, all involved parties. That is super important. And let me add here already, that because of this complexity, it really means that the project manager cannot hold all of the answers because the world is too complex for that. So we need to shift to a place where as leaders, we are much better at accessing the team's genius. So that's really part of the premise for why empowerment is so important. And you know, I talk about project leadership here and sometimes we contrast leadership to management. And I'm going to hand back over to Merv and have you interact with us again to answer what is it really that are some of the differences between management and leadership? Okay, Suzanne, I've, um, let's just 
display my screen, I've launched the next question. Um, and it's uh, similar to the previous one. In fact, I think you've got the opportunity to write slightly longer um, sentences as opposed to one word. But what we want to know from you is what are some of the differences between management and leadership? So before we embark on our next session, it'd be great to get your thoughts on that. So um, uh, we maybe the first one is, is contentious. I think you can see that there, but um, first person to put none, um, but I'm sure we'll have some more. Let's say we've got um, over uh, almost 40 of you on the call. So Again, Suzanne, did you want to speak to any of them as they come in? Um, we'll leave this running. Yeah, I'm while. also just um, thinking to remind people, if you're unsure where these answers come from, go online, type in menti.com, perhaps on your phone, and use the code 325361 to participate. All right, what do we have here? Leadership is providing direction and being proactive. Action versus direction. Not really sure which is which. Leaders take us on a journey. Yes, vision. I assume vision is on the leadership, but I can't be sure. All right. Leaders take teams to where they would not go by themselves. Managers are resource handlers. Management is dealing with day-to-day -day tactical. Leadership is about strategy. Oh, it's wonderful. Please keep them coming in. This is really good. And leadership is more about empowering people. Leadership is being proactive. I think you're getting the gist of this. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Let's um, let's go back and have a look at some of the words that um, I have chosen to illustrate the differences. Okay. So that's swapping back to you, isn't it? Let's just do that. There we go. All right. So I have chosen some words here on the screen. Your descriptions were really lovely. Thank you so much for interacting with us. There is absolutely an overlap between management and leadership. That's why we have a Venn diagram. We might choose, or the words I've chosen here is management is more task oriented, transactional. It's about rational thinking, perhaps instructing people or giving very clear direction. Whereas leadership, as some of you said, is more people oriented. It's more about my attitudes and behaviors rather than just this, the, the, the knowledge I have. It's inspiring, it's about being visionary, and it, we have the word empowers, we empower people. So these are some of the differences here. I, I like to say we manage tasks and we lead people. Now for me, one of the big differences is, as you see here on the right-hand side, a little bit further down than halfway through, emotional intelligence. You have probably all come across, I certainly have, managers that were quite clever. They were very, you know, they were cognitively very intelligent. But have you ever seen a leader who did not have a high amount of emotional intelligence? For me, that's really a key part. And that's something I really would like all of you to put some consideration towards. And we can look a little bit more at what emotional intelligence is. I mean, it's a huge topic and we can't cover it all here because that also I don't want to oversimplify it, but I do want to encourage you all to look into emotional intelligence, not just read about it, but practice it, because it is something we need to practice. As you can see, or as I'm trying to illustrate from this slide, on the left-hand side, emotional intelligence is something about self. First, we have to look inwards. Be self-aware. And being able to manage yourself, that means not just reacting, not just getting angry when you feel peed off or just, you know, yeah, reacting to what happens on your project team, because there are so many things that can trigger us. It's about choosing your response. And on the, um, the bullets here, you see a few pointers on what you can do to work with emotional intelligence. It's about reflecting, reflecting on your, on your own feelings, it's about reflecting on your own patterns, how you tend to react, and really stopping and consciously choosing how you might respond in a situation. It sounds simple, but actually it's not. So you might want to choose a mentor or coach to help you here. On the right-hand side, emotional intelligence is also about others, 
are you able to tune into others? In this case, it would be your stakeholders, your clients, your team members. Are you able to begin to walk in their shoes to see the situation from their point of view? Yeah, empathizing and using that, your insight into what's going on for the other person to build relationships of trust. And so many of us, we're so busy, we, you know, just making decisions and moving forward that we, we don't take the time to notice, to really ask, to really listen to others. And that's what is so crucial here. So I'm, I'm going to leave that and not say anything else at this point in time about emotional intelligence other than encourage all of you who want to move into leadership to really work with these topics. Now we're going to look in more depth at empowerment. So as I've mentioned before, well, I, I'm not actually sure I mentioned it during my, um, when, I, when I introduced myself, but um, along my journey, I wrote The Power of Project Leadership. That was in 2015. It's the um, book with the, with the golden cover there. And the second edition came out just a month ago, which is a, a fully revised edition. And there are seven keys inside the book. And today we're just homing in a little bit more on key number four, which is about empowering the team. Emotional intelligence is actually a topic that goes throughout the book. And again, I want to take the opportunity to remind us why is empowering the team so important? Because in this world of, com of increased complexity, the project manager cannot hold on the answers. This notion that we saw before about being the manager, the manager who is rational, who directs, who makes all the decisions, that is very difficult to use that model in today's world because you, ha you do not have all the answers. You do not have enough answers to just instruct the team. You need to access the genius of the team in order to deal with these many facets of complexity that are surrounding us. What you see on the screen here at the moment are different strategies on how you can begin to empower your team. And it's taken from the book. So there are, yeah, well, different, different angles here. If you look at the left-hand side at the bottom, create a safe space. A little bit further up, support and praise, utilize strengths. So what do they sound like? Well, they sound like quite supportive. So we need to definitely be there for our team members to create a supportive, a safe space. But that's obviously not the full picture. Further up from that, hold to account. And on the other side, stretch and challenge. So we very much have opposing forces here. Yes, we need to support and praise, but we also need to stretch and challenge. And I want to go further into that thought with, by using the analogies of yin and yang. So yin, you could say, is traditionally our feminine supportive element, and yang is that masculine challenging element. So when we use a lot of yin with our team members, oh, we listen, we support, we ask them what they need, how we can help them. We make them feel confident and we really provide a safe space for them to step forward. We empathize with them. Fabulous. We need that. But we certainly also need the other side of the coin. To challenge people, to hold them to account and to hold them to account to what they have said they're going to deliver. And to help them deliver their best work. So if somebody doesn't deliver what they said they were going to deliver, instead of saying, oh, I, I, I understand, you know, perhaps tomorrow you can deliver it. Well, do you think the team member is going to feel compelled to rising to the challenge? So we really need these two opposing forces. And I think what's so interesting for me is when I, the people I coach, I often see people being one of, they're stronger in either the yin or the yang. And Right now, I'm going to hand back over to Merv because we would like to hear from you. Take a moment to check in. How much yin versus yang do you tend to use in your daily work? Okay, thanks very much, Suzanne. So, um, different style of question here, but uh, you can see there is a is the image there as a reminder. So, yin and yang. Uh, let's hide the image now. 
and um, hopefully you can now um, vote. And this will be interesting in terms of the spread, uh, the support and the challenge. All right, this is interesting. I assume we're seeing the aggregated score there. So we have a lot of people yes. who are, well, we actually we're all over the chart, aren't we? But, mm. but mostly so on high support and some challenge, above average challenge. Yes, I'm guessing that actually this is showing then um, slightly more support than challenge, isn't it, uh, in terms of the, the overall average? But as you say, what a spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we shouldn't be fooled by the one because the one is an aggregated score, but actually people are the somebody yes. who is at very high yin, very high yang. We have one or two people who are in the bottom left-hand quadrant, which is very little yin and, and also below average yang. Not below average, but... Mm. Uh. Okay, shall we see what it all means? Yeah, indeed. Let's just flip back. So, uh, there we go. Wonderful. So you should be able to see the same matrix here. And let's have a look at what it means depending on where you put your own score. And thank you again for interacting with us. I, I'm, fine. I'm quite enjoying this. I'm hoping you are too. So if you had a score in the top left-hand corner, it means that you were high on yang, very support, very low on ying. We could map this to a leadership style from Daniel Goldman. He talks about six leadership styles, which is the directive leader. So the directive leader, do what I tell you, or else it may have implications is what that leadership st style says. It really demands that you comply and well, you could say this is quite an old fashioned leadership style, but it does work well at times in crisis situations, because the thing is, there is a time and a place for all leadership styles, but yeah, it's not the most empowering style. Going a little bit further down, we could talk about the pace setter. So the pace setter is somebody, typically a technical project manager who rolls up the sleeves. They know how to get things done because they've been there, done it, and they set the standard. So what a pace setter uh, says is, I know how to do it. Just copy me. Yeah, copy me, and you'll be uh, you'll be you'll be favoured. It works really well when the team standard is low, but in the long term, it's actually can be alienating to the team. Let's go in the opposite direction here. A lot of yin and very little yang. We could call this, this is what Daniel Goleman calls it, affiliative. So an affiliative leader is somebody who really values harmony and is good at asking the team members, how are you feeling? How can I support you? And in, you know, some people see it as quite a weak leadership style, but again, there is a time and a place for it. If the team has undergone a lot of uncertainty, a lot of change, if they feel really unsure, where well, we need a leader who can really support this is not the time to challenge. Moving on, we have more of a democratic leader, a little bit more challenge up here, but still on, on the low challenge quadrant. So democratic is really good for building consensus. This is a leader who says, okay, what can we agree to? So I become more of a facilitator here. Visionary style is a fifth style that Daniel Goleman talks about. And as it implies, this is somebody who's really good at setting the vision and at um, inspiring the team. It would be great, is what the visionary leader says. Come with me, it's this way. But the visionary leader does not tell us how to get there. And then the last style is a coaching style. And coaching style has a lot of support in it, but it also has, perhaps surprisingly, quite a bit of challenge. Because the coaching leader really is good at asking people so what do you think the answer is? How can we get there? What action are you going to take? And actually holding people to account to the direction they're setting themselves. So this is a fabulous style that works super well when we talk about empowering others. But I do want to emphasize that all of the styles have a time and a place. 
However, the coaching and the visionary together as a long-term strategy does tend to work quite well when in, on the topic we're talking about today, empowerment. I also want to draw your attention to Liz Wiseman. She wrote the book Multipliers, and she talks about two different kinds of leaders. She talks about multipliers and diminishers. Let's look at the diminisher. A diminishing leader is, according to Liz Wiseman, somebody who makes you feel smaller than you are. And I have certainly worked for leaders like that. They felt they had all the right answers. They wanted to hear themselves speak. And when you were with them, they just made you feel less confident. On the other hand, we have multipliers who have the opposite effect. These are the kinds of leaders who make you feel smarter than you are. They don't pretend they have all the answers because they don't. And they're upfront about that. They would rather create the debate in the room than hear themselves speak. And here you see in a chart format some of the differences in behavior between diminishers and multipliers. So on the left-hand side, a diminisher believes he is the smartest person in the room with all the great ideas. Multiplier coaches and teachers in order to unleash the team's best thinking. Diminisher doesn't leave space for people to think through challenges themselves. That's the third line down whereas the multiplier creates a safe environment for team members to contribute. And there's a few more differences here you can pick up on. Multipliers really give ownership. They drive a rigorous debate. They create an intense environment, whereas a diminisher makes centralized decisions and they drive results through their own involvement. So this relates a little bit back to the management versus leadership we looked at before. There's not a direct 100% match, but there are certainly more management characteristics in the diminisher and there are more leadership characteristics in the multiplier. And again, when we link it back to a world with more complexity, I keep coming back to the central theme. We cannot have project managers who believe they have all the answers because that means that we are excluding ourselves from all the complexity that is making our, that, that is, that is impacting us from inside the project and from outside the project. There's only one way, and that is to draw people in to empower the team. One of the ways that we can do that is through questions. Questions really stimulate the team to think for themselves. It's the opposite of telling people what to do. And I want you to just have a look at some of these different questions here. What are we not seeing that is new or different? Imagine you ask your team that. What are we not seeing that is new or different? It's a completely open question. What have we not yet invested in that could make a big difference? And then we have these what if questions. They're magical. What if we only had half the time? What would we do then? So we're throwing our assumptions away and, and looking at a much more open field. What if we had no constraints? What if we could start all over? So open questions are one of the ways in which multipliers empower the teams, in which multipliers support and challenge at the same time. Because what you're seeing here, I'm not being critical towards you. I'm not putting you down. I'm not just challenging you to innovate and come up with new ideas. No, I am Challenging you, challenging you to come up with new ideas, and I want, I'm going to support you in implementing them. I'm not putting myself on the center stage here as a leader. I'm really encouraging the team to step forward and step up to the challenge. Now, let's look at some of the science behind high-performing teams. There's quite a few... There's a number of, of studies that have taken place. Some of them have been written about in Harvard Business Review. And one of these studies is from Google. And Google have lots of teams. And Google had a whole department allocated to studying their team's performance. They wanted to understand what is it that makes some teams high performing within Google and other teams lower performing. And so they set out to study all kinds of different parameters. 
how much were people being paid? Were people team members? Were they friends outside of work? Uh, did they have flexible working? All kinds of parameters that you can, you can imagine. But to Google's surprise, they did not find any correlation. But they did find something else. They found that they could observe when a team was high performing. They could see it. They could see the difference between a high performing team and a low performing team. And what they saw were the communication dynamics. So a high performing team, everybody would communicate in roughly equal amounts. Everybody in the team would contribute in, approximately, in approximately equal amounts. So what does it look like? Well, imagine you have five team members. Probably if you have been in that situation, two or three of the team members are going to do normally most of the talking, most of the decision making. They're going to drive most of the debate. But in this case, in high performing teams, everybody speaks in roughly equal amounts with each other, not just going through the project manager. And at the end of a meeting, if two people having said much, the rest of the team are encouraging the two team members to say something. So, Paul, we haven't heard much from you in this meeting. What do you think? So we are actively involving and encouraging each other to share. So Google thought, OK, if we can see the difference, how come that some teams have these very dynamic communication patterns, whereas others don't? And they came to a term that is called psychological safety. I think I already mentioned it. When a team member feels psychologically safe, he or she will be more inclined to share and come forward and challenge. Share their ideas. Share their concerns. Challenge decisions. But if I'm going to be shut down, if I'm going to be criticized, and I'm a little bit introverted, there's no way that I am going to come forward so this is one of the building blocks. It is not the only one. It is one of the building blocks of a high performing team. It is probably where it starts because you need all of the engines of the team to work optimally. And there's another term that we need to talk about here, which is social sensitivity. And this links back to emotional intelligence. All of the team members need to self regulate. They need to be socially sensitive to other team members. What does it mean? It means they need to hold back and not talk all the time if they're very extroverted. It means they need to be sensitive to the moods of others, to read what is going on for the other person so that we can all contribute and communicate in equal terms. There's another communication dynamic that we see in high performing teams, and that is that people tend to speak more dynamically with each other. They tend to face each other. And not surprisingly, face-to-face -face communication is the most effective. Texting and emailing, WhatsApping, whatever, least effective for building that high-performing team. So there's a number of other elements in addition to this that helps create a high-performing team. But I think this is one of the most important ones. You can also derive from this that you need teams that are not too large, because if everybody is to speak to everybody, how do you do that if you have 20 team members? So if you have a large team, it's about splitting your team into smaller groups and having a core team so that you can truly optimize and make sure that everybody communicates with everybody within that sub team. Another interesting thing that happens when you have high performing teams is that team members begin to care about each other's personal goals. So not only are we tracking our work goals, which is obviously what we need to deliver for the project. If somebody needs to lose 10 pounds or if somebody wants to run a marathon, that also becomes something that the team tracks. So it's like we become more integrated. We care more about each other. And I want to make you aware of Patrick Lencioni. And I would like to encourage you to watch one of his videos. This is, I think it's a 45 minute video or 40 minute video. You can find it on YouTube if you Google Patrick Lencioni, Royal Albert Hall, the five dysfunctions of a team. It is not only very informative, it is also very, very funny. 
Patrick Lencioni wrote a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and the five dysfunctions are displayed here on the right-hand side. He's saying that, well, you have absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and inattention to results. And everything begins with the absence of trust at the bottom here. Or said in another way, in order to build team performance and get to results at the top of the pyramid, you need to show vulnerability because Patrick Lencioni talks about vulnerability-based trust, which is the kind of trust in the team that doesn't come from just working together for a long time. You may have experienced that you work with some team members for like three, four years while well, you still don't trust them or they still don't trust you. Vulnerability-based trust is a kind of trust that happens when you are able to open up and say, I don't know, I don't have the, I don't have the answer here, or you know what, it's okay to make, to make mistakes. I've also made a mistake. Then we begin to trust each other at a completely different level. And you know, we, he has the second one here, fear of conflict. Conflict is very healthy, because if we have psychological safety and we have everybody feeling um, trust, then we're okay to share our differences then it becomes a healthy debate about how we could do things differently. So conflict is not a bad thing. It is about the way we approach conflict. Are we able to talk through it without shooting each other down? So I really encourage you to, um, to have a look at this video. And I have some questions for you, which is just for you to take away and ponder. The first one is, are people trying to contribute on your, on your project and being ignored or cut off either by yourself or by other team members? Do you personally do most of the talking at your meetings without giving others enough space to participate? Perhaps because time is short, you need to move forward. It's so tempting to make rash decisions and just to move forward with a majority vote. And the last one, are you personally able to show vulnerability and signal to others that it's okay to fail? So just a few questions for you to ponder. We're not going to do Menti on this one, uh, but I think, you know, uh, take a screenshot of this page and, um, and get back to them and, and ponder. It could make a huge difference to the dynamic of your team and to the performance of your team. I would also like to talk about communication because all of this ties into communication. We know it. We often say that 80% of a project manager's role is to communicate. And what I'm going to share with you now is four different levels at which we can communicate. We tend to communicate at the top two levels, and we don't really get to the bottom two levels. The idea with the model I'm going to share with you here is that you use all of the levels if you want to build great relationship with your stakeholders, if you want to empower your team. So let's look at the four levels. The first level is content and topic. This is where we tend to spend most of our attention. So what does it look like? As project managers, we spend most of our time talking about what needs to get done on the project, the facts and the figures, the issues and the risks. And of course, well, that's very important. You might also spend some time talking about procedure and structure, how things are going to get done. This is, after all, the planning, sequencing, when, who, how. OK, so far, so good. This is above the water. Yeah, this is what you see if you're thinking about this as an iceberg below, above the water. But we need the next two levels in order to really get in deep with your team members and your stakeholders. Interactions and behavior. How often do you talk to people about how you are going to work together? What we expect of each other? What we expect of each other when we're in meetings? How are we going to work together? What's going to happen when we don't agree? How are we going to make decisions together? What are our ground rules? So important. And the last one, emotions and feelings. Oh, gosh, but we're talking project management. What about emotions and feelings? Well, the thing is, we're all emotional beings, aren't we? That's why it's called emotional intelligence. It is important 
that you as a project manager and leader are able to pick up on this, that you can ask people, how are you feeling? That you can pick up on what's going on for others and that you can use your intuition. I'm going to read a sample dialogue for you so you can see how you might use all of the four levels, let's say in a team meeting. So imagine you're in a kickoff meeting. At level one, content and topic, you might say the following to your team. It's pretty exciting that we finally get to start this project. We have already talked about the deliverables. I'd like to spend a bit more time explaining the benefits and why this is such an important initi initiative for our customer. All right, good stuff. It's all at level one. It's important, but it's not the full story. At level two, you might say, which collaborative tools are, would you like us to use? Who will make sure that we get the communication platform up and running by next week? All right, it's a little bit more about how something will be done. At level three, you might say, I would like all of you in this kickoff meeting to write down one ground rule for how you would like us to work together. This could be any type of behavior that you feel is important for a well-functioning team. And the way you can do this is just by giving people a post-it note and write down an expectation they have, what behaviors they would like to see from each other, and you have that conversation. All right, at level four, you might say, how do you guys feel about the project? Is there anything else we need to consider to make you fully motivated? So it might sound quite simple now that I talk about it, but hand on your heart, how much time are you spending on each of these four levels? And we would really like to have your feedback again and your interaction with us and Menti. So I'm going to hand back over to Merv. Okay, thank you very much, Suzanne. Different different type of question here, and I, I put a little bit of guidance into, into how you might do that. So those four levels that are obviously fresh in your mind, um, content and topic, through to emotion and feelings, you've got 10% um, for each. So you can add 10%, but you've only got, as you can imagine, a total of 100% 100, 100 or 100 points to, uh, to allocate. So you can see here, there's a, an individual that's spent their 100% um, their with 50% on uh, content and topic and, and on it goes. We've still got um, 44 of you on the call, which is fantastic. So we'd, um, we'd love to see, I think we've been seeing about 20, 25 people voting up until now. So it will give us a really good sense of where people are. Um, Feel free, Suzanne, to comment as things are coming in. It looks like um, content and topic are, are winning out. But Yeah, so uh, 12 people have answered. Uh, do not get confused, as Merv said, by this new way of interacting. You're simply out of 100%. You're simply allocating your percent for the four topics. I'm not surprised that content is the top one. That's what I would expect, procedure and structure number two, because as project managers, this is what we're comfortable doing. We're talk comfortable talking about what needs to get done, and we should be comfortable talking about how to do it. But interactions and behaviors, actually, it's, it's not too bad. It's, it, it is certainly getting some, some attention, and emotions and feelings does figure, doesn't it? It is on there with a, with a 10%. Um, so, but I think the, the numbers are relatively stable. So um, thank you to the okay. 23 people who have voted. Let's flick back. I know we're under a little bit of pressure of time, but hopefully we'll have time for a few questions uh, at the end, but um, back to you now. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so this brings me back to how we can begin to communicate more at the fourth level, how you can deepen that communication. And just a reminder, I guess, or a comment here, because as project managers, we are so comfortable defining the project. This is what we do. What are we going to deliver? Who's going to deliver it? By when? How much? But are we comfortable defining the team? And for me, this is something that I would encourage everybody to spend time on not just defining the project, but defining the team, agree the ground rules and create a team charter. 
If you haven't heard about a team charter before, I have a template on my website, suzannematson.com, under the resources page. You can get free access to it. It is, it's in a sense, you sit down with your team and you talk about how we will work together. Maybe you come up with a team name. Maybe you come up with how you're going to celebrate success. Maybe you're going to track each other's personal goals. You will definitely write down what some of your values are and what behaviors you expect from each other. It can be such a valuable and a real game changer to do that. So that's really all I'm going to say here. And the last topic we will cover before the questions um, is collaborative planning. It's another powerful way of really empowering your team. Sorry, I use powerful and empowering in the same sentence, which might be a bit overkill there. But when I coach project managers, I am often surprised slightly negatively that even very senior project managers tend to um, plan on their own. Sure, they get input from the team, but they don't really collaboratively plan. Collaborative planning looks like what you see in the picture here. You get everybody together in a room, and if your team is true to virtual, either you get them together as a one-off exercise, or you find a collaboration tool that can do this. Of course, I'm not going to lie, if you're together in, in person, it is more effective. And you brainstorm everything that needs to get done within the scope of the project. You plot it into a work breakdown structure, you create some, some work streams, you put it on a chart with the timeline at the top, your work streams at, at, on the left-hand side, so you have these swim lanes, you begin to place the um, post-its or the milestones where they need to happen. This is a high-level plan. This is a first kind of cut of your plan. It is not the nth degree or the final detail plan, but it's been done collaboratively. What you can now do is that you put an owner to each of the milestones there or each of the post-it notes. Each person goes away and they validate when they can actually do it by. So they come back into the room. You do a second workshop where people commit to the dates. So you firm up the plan. So what I'm saying is, this is a little bit iterative, but this is the very first cut of a plan. Do not do it on your own. Please do involve the team truly involve the team. And so um, I'm happy to tell Merv that we, you, we will have time for questions because um, essentially I'm going to encourage you now to connect with me if you would like to stay in touch. There is my website, suzannematson.com. As I said, there is my, uh, I have lots of resources on there that you have free access to. On YouTube, I have a number of short videos on a number of management and leadership topics. There is my book, The Power of Project Leadership. It's available on Amazon and on my website, powerprojectleadership.com. That is my website. And LinkedIn, of course, do connect on LinkedIn. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to Merv. OK, th thanks ever so much for that, Suzanne. So um, yes, we'll move into questions. Um, please do send them in um, via the uh, the go to webinar you'll also see what we're displaying at the moment is which words best describe what you've learned from this webinar so something of a kind of uh, a sandwich there because we asked you what you expect to learn and we we'd like to know now um, what you have learned uh, excuse me i don't think i've changed presenter over so let me just do that um, so uh, there we are um, so we want to hear from you again um, what you've learned in your own words so, uh, and I'll, I'll perhaps come back to that when we've dealt with one or two questions, but um, yeah, I can see the answers starting to come in. So, um, questions. We've got a, a number here. I, I suppose one of them, uh, having regard to our audience, many members of PMI work on global projects um, and not just based within the UK. And it's a kind of, do you have a, um, some sort of international perspective on leadership and, and management, perhaps the, the, the balance of the two? Uh, geography or something like that. Yeah, it's a good question, and and if the um, if the people would like to be more specific, that's also good. But I do deliver training all over the world, all continents. I haven't yet been to South America, so I have to exclude South America. And what's so interesting, I also deliver um, coaching and training across industries, and people always think that their industry and their business is so unique. 
and they would like me to know their insights exactly on their business. And you know what? Often it's the same challenges that come up no matter where you are. And it's people. People are the biggest challenges. How do I gain buy-in? How do I deal with a, what I think is a difficult client, which may just be a client who I have difficulties empathizing with? It is the challenge that comes up again and again. How do I deal with an underperformer? How do I deal with how do I, how the accountability? How do I get people to do the work on the team if they don't report directly to me? And of course, the the answer is um, is to step more into the leadership side. And um, and I know it's it's a broad answer. The one exception actually is when I delivered uh, training in China because in China they um, really like to be told what to do. And as a trainer, there was a lot of demand on me to be very explicit when to do what. And they were not so good at thinking outside of the box, I found, and to deduct things. So so that was the one uh, an anom anomaly, actually. Mm. Okay. And I, I suppose uh, something, in fact, I, I read this week, so this is my question. Um, and it was about, um, I think it's called SAFE, the scale agile framework and on there there was a term I hadn't um, come across called the agile road train and this was about teams of teams that were very effective in um, in pushing out um, I guess products etc so the question is around kind of the the um, maybe the characteristics of agile and adaptive methods versus waterfall and traditional methods and do you see do you see any differences there in terms of leadership styles? Yeah, I think agile is a big topic that's come up from well over the last many years actually. For me, leadership, and and you could say when teams are self managing, so there's more of a leader there perhaps, and there's more empowerment of the team if you run truly agile teams. For me, the leadership even if we're running waterfall projects, there should be that good set of leadership skills of equal equal challenge, equal support should be the same. I, I think, no, I think my answer is no. I don't think the leadership, in terms of what, what good leadership looks like, it should be the same. And I would also say that I've seen many people, many teams run something of agile, but it's not agile or they want it to be 100% Agile, and it doesn't have to be 100% Agile. I think what we need to get to a point where we implement the methodology that makes the, no, that makes the most sense, no matter what we call it. We need to have people at the core. We need to have a methodology that empowers the team, and maybe it doesn't matter so much what we call it. But psychological safety needs to be there anyway. <laughs> Mm. Does that, I'm not sure that answers your question, Merv. Well, I, I don't think it was a very specific question, so I think I think that is uh, yeah a good uh, a good answer. Um, we've got an, another question around uh, the whole business of multipliers and diminishers, and the question is, is it possible if you're a diminisher to become a multiplier? You know, I know for a fact that some people have bought the book, Liz Wiseman's book, anonymously, and they've put it onto on their boss's desk. <laughs> I think that's that's quite a drastic action, and it may not mean that the um, that the manager actually becomes then a multiplier. I think yes, people can change. People do change. I run leadership courses, uh, leadership workshops that happen over a six months period we see people three times or three days each people do change they change small small pieces they begin to listen more they begin to ask more they begin to give fewer solutions uh, to 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 be less directed with the team so people will not change radically my experience but but people can and will change if they want to make a change so first of all people gotta the person's got to recognize that there is uh, so, They've got to take feedback on board, want to change, and they've got to uh, work with, with, with somebody who can help them. It is possible, yes. Okay, thank you. And perhaps the, the final question we'll take is, um, what differences do you see between um, project, programmer, and portfolio management? So, yes. So I'm guessing this is not a technical question. Um, because you know we would be summarizing the roles and responsibilities that are different. From a 
leadership role, again, the leadership characteristics, I don't think are that different because we're talking about asking more questions, we're talking about listening more to people, we're also talking about holding people to account. So those core characteristics of what a good project leader or program manager, program management leader, or portfolio management leader looks like, I think because it's not so much about the skills, it's more about your attitudes and behaviors, mm. I would say from a leadership point of view, they should be quite similar. Yeah. Okay, that, that's that's fantastic. As I say, I think we're probably about there on time. So I've got a, a, just a couple of things to, to finish up with. So um, in fact, let's just flick back to see. Yeah, we've got 15 people who've actually said, uh, told us what they've learned. And so we'll um, perhaps examine that a little bit later on. But uh, thank you for that. Keep that coming. 